Oh, I'm here with conductor Kathy Saltzman Romy. Um, for the benefit of our viewers, we're recording this on Tuesday, June 2nd uh, at around noon Eastern time. Kathy is in Minneapolis. So let me begin by just asking you how you are and uh, what it's been like for you these past few days. Thank you, Frank, and it's great to see you. Um, it's been a very difficult week in the Twin Cities. Uh, on Monday, uh, May 25th, we lost um, the artistic director or former artistic director of the Minnesota Corral, Joel Refson, to secondary complications with COVID. On that same day, George Floyd um, was brutally killed in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. And since that time, it has been incredibly turbulent, highly emotional, and um, a feeling of just unbelievable um, desperation for so many people and within our community. Um, the brighter side, the hopeful side is that so many people have come together um, to not only celebrate the life of George Floyd, uh, but also to uh, support one another, to clean up the streets following protests and to support communities through the donations of um, resources and food. So there is both the um, terribly tragic aspects of all of this and there's also the um, really inspiring moments of people coming together. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think we're all looking towards substantive change and hope for the future uh, in terms of coming together um, around really critical issues that have been dividing our community for years. Yes. And as musicians and artists, the question is, how do you do this? And so with COVID-19 and the limitations that are placed upon us in terms of coming together, um, it's also been really moving to see how people have reached out in other ways, um, not only through their music uh, online, but also in coming together as a community um, to provide uh, comfort and consolation to people and also just to be there to support um, in other ways. So we are searching, I think, as, as musicians and artists as to our role in society and certainly in times like this. Yes, um, you know, musicians, singers especially, have often been among the most active participants in all sorts of community uh, related life. Uh, and one hopes that, that we'll find a way to help express how we're feeling and also help heal. You know, after uh, September 11th, there were so many concerts and so many people donating their time and donating their efforts in, in an attempt, as you say, to all come together. Uh, and we hope that that will continue. Uh, but as you say, it's a challenge uh, given, given COVID and our need to separate at the same time. That's right. So um, who knows what the coming days, weeks, or year will bring. Hmm. Uh, but what is really um, encouraging is that people are finding new ways to connect and to express themselves. And um, again, coming together in really creative ways uh, to express their emotions and um, yes. hopes for the future. And you know, <laughs> the old phrase, necessity is the mother of invention comes to mind. I was talking with Tom Hall recently who said, you know, somebody will come up with an idea that we haven't thought of yet as yes. to continue to make music uh, and continue to, to be together, which is so much a big part of music making and, and our experience. I completely agree with Tom. Right. And look forward to the innovations that are forthcoming. Yes, exactly. So I wonder whether we can transition a little bit to your life as a conductor. Um, those who have worked with you at BCI or BCF at, uh, in the old days know uh, a little bit about your background, but for those who are listening today who may not know, can you give us a brief 
musical bio, um, including how you got made the transition from somebody who studies music as a child, as many people do, to being a professional musician, number one, and then specifically as a conductor. Absolutely. Uh, I think I've told this story at Berkshire Choral Festival numerous times, but I will repeat it one more time. Uh, my father uh, was a choral conductor, so I grew up in a singing family. And uh, as I'm the eldest of four girls, I certainly look to my father for um, kind of the ideas of what I might do with my life. And so in third grade, I told a little boy, um, he said, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to be a conductor. And he said, you can't be a conductor. You're a girl. And I said, no, I'm going to be a conductor. And when we graduated together um, from college at the University of Oregon, he asked me, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to Germany to study conducting. And he said, you told me in the third grade that you wanted to do that. Uh, so it was always a, a lifelong passion of mine. Um, to to do the same work as my father. Um, I was a flute performance major at the university, but I knew almost immediately that was not my calling. So following my undergraduate degree, I did go to Germany to study conducting with um, Bach scholar and conductor Helmut Rilling and lived there for five years uh, and then returned to the United States and moved to the Twin Cities with my husband, where I assisted Dale Warland at McAllister College for a year. And when he took a leave of absence, I stepped into his position and led um, choral activities at the college for seven more years before I moved to the University of Minnesota. And at the same time that I was teaching at the university, I also uh, began assisting with the symphony chorus, the Minnesota Chorale, and that's where I met Joel Revson, who I referenced earlier. And he mentored me in um, exploring the choral symphonic repertoire and ultimately I became the artistic director of the Minnesota Chorale. Mm. Additionally, I work with Bach festivals. So I've been the course master of the Oregon Bach Festival for many years, um, preparing for not only Helmut Rilling and then Matthew Halls who followed him as artistic director, but also many wonderful guest conductors. Additionally, I've worked in Germany with the Bach Festival, the Young Stuttgart Bachen Ensemble, <clears throat> sponsored by the International Bach Academy of Stuttgart bringing together young people from all around the world uh, in the study of Bach. And in fact, in March of this year, I was in Germany um, working with a choir of um, singers and also instrumentalists from 30 different countries on the B minor mass and um, the Kurtner Trauer Musik, which is um, essentially so a song of lament drawn from the St. Matthew Passion, 24 different movements. And this is when COVID really hit extremely hard in Europe. And so um, we were to have performed the B minor mass on Bach's birthday, March 21st, but the entire ensemble was disbanded 10 days early. Mm -hmm. And there were probably 10 of us from the United States and Canada and another 10 plus from South America. So we were among the many people traveling back from Europe um, right. that, it, to get a flight, clearly. It was, yes, it was difficult to get a flight home. Um, but the last live music making that I was part of was the B minor mass, which mm -hmm. we performed in our, in a dress rehearsal, a, you know, quasi dress rehearsal. We didn't have trumpets. We didn't have the timpani. So the oboe instructor was playing the trumpet part from the, from his miniature score and you know, our chorus of 32 continually grew as the voice teachers joined in and their student soloists joined in. And so the last music that rings in my ears with this, was the Dona Novis Pachem of the Bima Novis. Well, what a wonderful experience and what a wonderful memory to Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, can we talk a little bit about what you just were saying about bringing together musicians from all over the world. I mean, is there something, it, it occurs to me, is there an issue with, you know, people in this country having this tradition of performing, uh, whether it's Bach or another composer, or people in this uh, country performing uh, with different traditions and how one brings that all together? Um, 
That's a great question, Frank. Um, I always look forward to working with the JSB Ensemble for this very reason, that there are young professionals from all over the world that come together that are eager to study the music of Bach, um, that want to learn and they want to explore this music and then take it home to their own communities. Um, yes, there are different approaches uh, to shaping this music, but ultimately um, we are committed to rendering the music, um, not only technically, but I, I would say expressively um, under the hands of whichever conductor is leading the ensemble. And so I would say that Hans Christoph Rademann as the artistic director of the International Bach Academy, who followed Helmut Rilling, is an amazing Bach uh, practitioner. And he brings such vitality uh, to his music making that I almost expect my ensembles to just, you know, levitate off the stage uh, mm -hmm. because they're incredibly invigorated in it and inspired by his, um, his work and his interpretation. And I think also the fact that as a child, he grew up singing chorales and this music, you know, in the church or at funerals, um, in the home. And so he brings a very personal relationship. So I think that um, all of us come together wanting to learn and to kind of unify our form of expression uh, and to further understand, you know, the relevancy of Bach in today's society. How wonderful. Yeah. Um, you do a great deal of preparing for other conductors in addition to your own uh, work as a conductor. Uh, and I wonder if, if we can talk about that for a little bit. For example, uh, at Oregon Bach Festival, um, preparing for Matthew Halls when he took over for Helmut Rilling, uh, and how you go about uh, your work uh, as someone who prepares for other conductors, and also uh, something about what you have learned from working with and watching these great conductors. Yeah. Well, it's always different. Uh, sometimes I feel almost like a detective, a musical detective, uh, as I try to acquaint myself with a new conductor and uh, what their style is, but more importantly, what are their priorities? What, is, what are their core values as a musician? And I want to best understand that um, when I approach the ensemble so that I can try to bring out those ideals um, and uh, forms of musical expression when I prepare them. But ultimately the preparation is about um, allowing them to be as comfortable as possible with the repertoire and also as flexible mm -hmm. as possible in terms of responding to whatever will be happening on the podium. Uh, certainly with a professional ensemble like the Oregon Bach Festival, and as I told my graduate students at the University of Minnesota, um, I have two rehearsals to prepare the St. John Passion, and I have three rehearsals for the B minor Mass and three rehearsals for the St. Matthew Passion. So I'm very strategic in terms of um, organizing my time and trying to offer singers just the opportunity to um, kind of revisit the repertoire and um, repeat, um, you know, singing through things with the idea that they uh, each time are listening to the ensemble around them and unifying um, kind of their shaping Mm. Um, the text and the music. Uh, with Matthew Halls, he was um, a conductor that didn't give me as much information beforehand. What I loved about his work is that he would step on the podium and he would literally try things with the ensemble in the moment. Let's mm. do it this way. No, let's do it this way. So I felt he was really open um, to experimenting with kind of the organic shaping of the music with the ensemble. And I would say to a certain extent that's true of Helmut Rilling, but he was much more specific um, in terms of uh, identifying the shaping of things. And Matthew Halls was as well, but there was just this almost sense of um, exploration that came with every rehearsal. And he had a wonderful way of describing music. And so each conductor is different. And I will say my first 
encounter with a new conductor um, is always a moment of somewhat you know, of stress and a little bit of anxiety. Have I anticipated clearly enough what they want and will my ensemble respond accordingly? Yes, right. And then it, I suppose it's a little bit like teaching, teaching your children to drive at a certain point. Right. Yeah. And you're putting on the brake, you know, pushing your foot to the floor, putting your brake on. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you were talking about having to prepare um, with so uh, few rehearsals. Uh, this came up recently in my own teaching with students were complaining about either not having enough rehearsal time for a particular opera or having to sit around while somebody else was rehearsing. And I said, you know, you will never again have as much rehearsal time as you have oh. while you're in school. <laughs> so, you look, are absolutely right. And, and learn from it, yes. Yeah. But there's something really um, exhilarating about the fact that an ensemble comes prepared um, and in that moment can sing through something, you know, with technical proficiency and then go back and repeat it and add yet another layer, you know, of musical shaping and expression. Uh, that, that's, I've always found extraordinary. On the other hand, I love, have loved my experiences at Berkshire Choral Festival because it allows you the time to step into the process with people who are so interested and so committed and so curious yes. about the music that is unfolding in front of them. And so I considered that a luxury as well, to have the time to explore and discuss and try things um, and, and to really methodically work through the technical challenges of any score, which all of us have to do. Yes, right. So speaking of Berkshire, um, you first conducted for us in 2007, I think it was. Uh, it was a Mendelssohn Psalm 42, Mozart C minor mass. Yes. Uh, I wonder whether you have any particular memories of uh, that year, how you got involved in BCI, or uh, you know the, the ongoing rehearsal process, the concerts, something you might want to share with us. Well, I will say um, I knew of BCI and the work from various colleagues and friends who had conducted there. And I um, certainly the reputation um, nationally has been one of excellence and depth uh, for the singers who have participated. And we have singers from the Twin Cities who have been regular BCI members. Um, so when you reached out and invited me, I was, I, I was so honored to be able to come and work with your community. And um, my memories of that first summer, um, in addition to the fact that it was incredibly hot, um, and, I, um, and also uh, that, that people were there giving 150% of themselves. I also remember the meals and um, where we could sit and talk with one another. I remember stories from singers. I remember activities that you provided in between that were enriching um, to those who had a lot of this week in their life to come together and make music. Uh, I remember the young people that were being mentored through this program, some of whom have come to my graduate conducting program oh, as a result of BCI. Yes, because I met them there, Ryan LeBoy. Oh yes, I'm so yeah. pleased to hear yeah. that. So um, I think that those are highlights in my mind of the first summer. Um, I, I think that there was also just the, um, my first encounter with that part of the country and so also just the really um, incredible idyllic scenery around me um, and the isolation um, of the environment, which offered opportunities for meditation and reflection, you know, as well as community. So I, I think that I also was struck by the fact that people wanted to also spend time alone as well as together. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, to think more deeply about their lives and their work and how music um, offers them, a, you know, an outlet um, in kind of processing what's going on in the world around us. And, and, and to be together for a week in which your only focus, your only goal, your only job is to 
immerse yourself in this music, get it up on stage. It's, it's quite, quite special. Yeah. I will also say that I remember the generosity of the staff, especially you um, as a colleague and um, collaborator. And um, that is what has made that festival so successful, is the commitment of that staff mm -hmm. and those voice teachers who come year after year and just invest fully in offering an experience which is really special. Thank you. That's very kind kind of you to say. You know, uh, another uh, memory I have, and this is one of my uh, favorite memories of, of my many years at BCI, is uh, to be certain of the dawn, which yes. you conducted for us. I think it was 2016. Yes. Incredibly moving piece. And that is one of those pieces that can unify um, uh, people. Um, were you involved in the premiere of that piece? I don't quite remember. Uh, the premiere was actually done through the Basilica of St. Mary. And then when they remounted the work, the Minnesota Chorale joined the choir from Basil the Basilica. And um, it was performed again, and then it was recorded. And so the recording involves my singers. Uh, and we are scheduled to perform it again this fall. Uh -huh. I am not sure whether that will happen. Uh -huh. But I will say that uh, based on my experiences with the Chorale and also at Berkshire, I did perform the work with my university students this past fall, mm. uh, 2019. And it was a similar journey to that of Berkshire, but just extended over a period of two and a half months. Mm. Um, and again, it was the aspect of um, interfaith dialogue and having the librettist Michael Dennis Brown come and speak. Um, the looking at uh, a work that had been specifically commissioned for our community um, as a gift from the Christian community to uh, the Jewish community. Uh, and I would say a spiritual journey very much akin to the passions of Bach. Mm. And, and I would say also inspired by Bach because you have that, you know, wonderful chorale that moves through. Yes. Um, you know, being sung in, in um, Hebrew, in English, in German, um, by the cantor alone, by the congregation, the community. And, and you shall love your neighbor as, as you do yourself. And, you know, those words are always important, always valuable, but now never more so. Yes, I agree. So I do hope that we come together um, it would have been a very special performance this fall to, to perform that work again in this community. And I'm hoping that we can revisit it, if not this fall, then in some years. Yeah. In the future. And I, I would eventually like to bring it back to the Berkshires uh, or Berkshire, wherever we are, but yes. to our organization. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you go about uh, learning a new piece? or a piece that is new uh, for you? A little bit about your process. Do you look at the music first? Do you look at the text first? What, you know, do you sit down at the piano? Give, a, give us some idea. The score then becomes just a personal roadmap with comments either from the conductor I may be preparing for, but also from the composer themselves or uh, the context in which the work was presented, uh, commissioned, historical, um, information surrounding that work or that time period. Um, and then ultimately the entire is kind of a global examination which moves down to kind of a microscopic examination uh, and then back to the global again. So it, uh, you know, it's always a wonderful journey, but for me, part of that process is also being on the podium with my ensemble and exploring that with them because they come with such insightful questions or comments. And that's what challenges us, I think, as educators and conductors is to think and respond to also, you know, people who are experiencing the work either for the first time or coming back to it, you know, from a different perspective. Right. And then once you hear it, as it were, up on its feet, your response to what you hear uh, and, and what you might need or want to do differently. Uh, right, exactly.
Um, so speaking of uh, learning, uh, you know, conductors are always teachers, uh, no matter with whom you're working. Uh, but you, you uh, and your work as a, 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 a at the university, can you talk a little bit about how you might work in a different way, or per, uh, or what is the same when you work with your university students? Uh, volunteers on uh, a BCI level, uh, your professional ensemble um, at Oregon Bath or uh, other places, how your approach, uh, what you do the same and what you may need to do differently. Right. Well, interestingly enough, um, this spring I was preparing the St. John Passion with my students at the University of Minnesota. And it was a chamber choir of 24. Um, all of the solos were going to be um, performed by members of the chorus. We were working with a professional period instrument ensemble and we were to have performed this on April 4th. Mm. Uh, so I would say that the process um, of preparing the work, you know, was much more extensive and we had ample time to not only learn the work technically, but also really delve into um, why it was written, what are the problems around the St. John Passion? We had a lot of um, discussions. Um, I had a lot of discussions with um, colleagues in the community, with um, faculty from the University of Minnesota who taught, teach in Jewish studies, with rabbis um, who were trying to provide wisdom and advice in my approaching this work. I mean, frankly, I've been terrified of the work. I, I've prepared it for many people but I've never conducted it myself because I have been uncertain as to how to approach um, the aspects of anti-Semitism that are part of um, the gospel text. And so this was a journey that I made alongside my graduate conductors and um, involved extensive dialogue, not only within the community, but also with my singers in the choir. Um, on a musical side, I would say, you know, we started the work at the end of January and by the beginning of March, before I left for Germany to work on the B minor, we had just covered the entire St. John Passion. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, that's, it was not quite two months, you know, of work on the chorales and the choruses and, um, you know, discussions and a little mini retreat and looking at structure and talking about German diction and all of the issues um, that surround, you know, a musical work of this um, magnitude. So I would say the process at the university is very similar to Berkshire because we have the luxury of time yes. because it is a laboratory setting. However, Berkshire is one week where we immerse ourselves and don't have to deal with the rest of our lives. And at the university, uh, in any setting, educational setting, our students are in and out of our rehearsals, you know, on a weekly basis, and they are dealing with the rest of their lives. So it always is a challenge, I think, to come back and refocus and say, where were we? And how do we pick up again? And how do we kind of scaffold our learning yes. from rehearsal to rehearsal? And, and this is, of course, the life of many of our choristers throughout the year that they, rather than immersing themselves, uh, they have weekly rehearsals and yes, how do you pick up from last week and what do you do, what do you remember and what, what, what needs to be refreshed, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I will also say um, the great thing about, you know, working in an educational setting is that many of my students are encountering this music for the very first time. I mean, of 24 graduates, you know, there were some undergraduate singers in there, juniors and seniors, but also many graduate students. Many of them had never sung Bach or sung a large work of Bach. And so, you know, it was an opportunity for me to teach a passion from the ground up, which does not happen very often. Um, and that just challenges you to think on, you know, a whole nother level uh, because there's just issues of, um, style and interpretation, which I think that many of your choristers at BCI come with, uh, because they've sung so much, they've heard so much, and the same at the Oregon Bach Festival. But here, my students are, you know, stepping in for the first time 
to this world. And so that's, that's part of the exciting, you know, process of working in an educational institution is to, to, you know, share in that discovery with them. Oh, thrilling. Uh, and, and I have to say, I envy them for, for discovering this. I'd love to see their face when they experience one of these unbelievable choruses or the beauty of the chorales uh, for the first time. It must be. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. What is, these are special moments. And I think I feel the same way with the JSB ensemble. You know, these are, while these are young professionals, many of my singers um, are coming and encountering a major work by Bach for the very first time. Uh, and so it's the same kind of BCI opportunity to leave your daily life, come together, immerse yourself in great music making uh, and exchange and dialogue, and then to walk away changed, um, you know, something that you will carry back to community. And in the case of the JSB ensemble, you know, I've gotten just wonderful emails over the past weeks from singers from around the world who had come to that experience or also the Weimar Bach Cantata Academy, which I led for five years with Helmut Rilling, um, who now, because of those experiences, have been able to study in Europe uh, in graduate programs or who have had artistic opportunities and um, open up to them. It's, you know, this is why we are so privileged to work in music and, and as a global community share in that together. That's a great place to leave our discussion. Kathy, thank you so much for talking with me today and allowing our choristers to, uh, to listen in. Uh, for those who are listening, we're going to transition to a question and answer period. So Kathy and I will both stick around for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. <laughs>